Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasha. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. If you've listened to radio, danced at a club, or played a recording during the past 50 years, you've enjoyed the rhythms and legendary drumming of Gregorico. As a founding member of the influential rock and funk group Sly and the Family Stone, Gregorico's innovative drum performances and use of the hi-hat and bass drum on recordings like Dance to the Music, I Want to Take You Higher, Everyday People, Thank you for letting me in. Hot Fun in the Summertime and Stan, among many, many others, helped bring about fusion of rock, funk, and jazz. For this accomplishment alone, Greg would have deserved his 1993 induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the R&B Foundation Pioneer Award given to the group at the Apollo Theater in 2001. In the more than 40 years since Sly and the Family Stone broke up, Arrico's performances have been sampled well over 1,000 times by various artists and bands. He continues playing and recording on some of rock and roll's most historic LPs and tours. Playing has always been my number one interest, Arrico states, but writing and producing are also important. A complete musician has abilities and experiences in all areas. You explore your instrument from writing and producing... One area strengthens another. Greg's writing contributions have brought him number one position on world pop charts in 2014 for the song Timber, which was also honored at the 32nd annual ASCAP Pop Music Awards for being among the most performed ASCAP pop songs of 2014. Other than raising a family in the San Francisco Bay Area, Greg stays active performing the music of Sly and the Family Stone, with various artists and is involved with Unity Music Foundation, for which he has produced several recordings featuring many world-class jazz artists, such as the Count Basie Orchestra. Please welcome the legendary drummer for Sly and the Family Stone and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, Class of 1993, Greg Arico, to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Greg. Ray, 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 you did that so well. Oh, thank you, thank you, man. I, I could have gone on and on, but, you know, I didn't want to overdo it. It sounds, it sounds like you've done that before. <laughs> a couple thousand right. times, I think. <laughs> All right. It's like, it's like me laying <laughs> All right. So what do, you got, what do you got going on lately? What's what's in your life? Well, you know, I keep busy. Uh, we just did a... I'm out, you know, doing performance of music that I help create. And record so long ago, right? Uh, still, and and um, blessed to be able to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was born in '48, so uh, time does not stand still for me or anybody else, actually. Yeah, and um, so I'm feeling pretty good. Try to keep in shape so I can still play. Right. One 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 thing does the other. You know, I keep in shape so I play, and playing keeps me in shape. So we can see uh, last interesting thing was um, notably interesting thing was I did a show in San Francisco Great American Music Hall with uh, Ivan Neville's Dumps to Funk uh, featuring myself and David Garibaldi drummer from Tower of Power. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, doing the Sly book and the song and the song book from Tower of Power mm-hmm. with the Tower of Power horn. So we just absolutely had a blast. And uh, unfortunately, it was, it was raining, just the horrible rain, and, and the show was running a little behind. All these people were heavy. Uh, it, was, it was a good crowd, you know. People came out, and, um, you know, they, I was just making the point that they had to stand out in the rain because they wouldn't open the doors. Oh, man. Uh, things were running behind. And uh, they were gracious enough to uh, put up with that, come in and have a good time. And we had a blast. Oh, yeah. that's, that's great, man. Uh, yeah. yeah, I love Tower of Power. I saw them many a times. Uh, who was the cat that used to spin around when he was uh, blowing his horn? He was kind of dancing in the circle. You know, every- oh, that's probably Lenny, yeah. uh, who was, uh, then went on to do Saturday Night Live. He was the music director and on and off there, and he's, he's still doing it. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah he was. Oh, man, oh, yeah, Lenny Pickett. 
Yeah, that was a kind of a signature move for the band too. You know, you, yeah. you always wanted to see yeah. that guy. <laughs> they, they've always had. I mean, for all the players, they've always had great players. Yeah, top notch. Oh yeah, I, yeah. But we can't. We all came up together back in the mid '60s. You know, they were in the East Bay. I was in San Francisco, and um, we used to, you know, pop in and see each other at various places as we were grinding away. <laughs> trying to make a living and uh, trying to make it happen. Well, you made it. It's hard to it, make a living well, at, at, at being a musician. It really is. It, it, it is. Yeah. And uh, she's probably even tougher today. I look back and, I, you know, I was just the right place at the right time. I mean, I feel fortunate. Uh, it's tough and things have changed a lot. And, in, in the, you know, in, in, in media, radio, uh, performance, I mean, Productions that come up, great shows go on now worldwide, festivals and all that. But it's just a, it's a different animal right. than it was when I was coming around, you know. Well, you know, a lot of the great uh, legends have a hard time getting record deals, and now they go on private labels because I guess there isn't any, uh, you know, huge record labels anymore. There's not many anyway, just a few. There's not many, no. Yeah. And it's, 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 again, it's different. But, you know, it's funny because the, the internet allows one to be visible. True. If you, if you, if you could, could connect with an audience, you create a fan base, you get out there. But there's a million other people doing it too. So at the end of the day, it becomes the same game as far as, you know, uh, rising above marketing, promoting, you know, being visible and being heard. Um, it was, it was difficult then. And, but, you know, you had the music. There were big record companies that you, you know, signed your life away yeah. to, and uh, they would pour a lot of money into to make it happen. And if you, again, if you connected, if you had good songs and performances, you connect with people. Well, you you became visible. You, it would happen. And it's kind of like the same thing today. You know, there's independent artists doing that. You know, right. <clears throat> Well, like you uh, said, there are a lot of great musicians out there today, but they're not getting the exposure like they should, you know, which is sad. Well, yeah, it, it, it's it's hard, but you you can. I mean, it it it, it happens, um, and it's difficult. Maybe in, in a different way than it was difficult back then. So at the end of the day, if you got the talent and you could connect with people, right? You got good good songs, good strong songs, good performances. You know, you will connect and you will create a fan base. You know, right? Um, it's just uh, at the end of the day, it's hard work. Yeah, you got to tour. Sure. You got to tour. Yeah, yeah. You got to play the clubs and you know you got to get out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, you started out. I think uh, didn't you first start out in Freddie and the Stone Souls? Mm-hmm. Sly's brother Freddie, we had a group. Right. For about a year before we started, you know, Sly and the Family Stone. So that's when you first, uh, I guess, met Sly in, in that band? Yeah, well, it, 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 this was Freddie's brother. Right. It, uh, I mean, Sly's brother, I'm sorry, Freddie. Mm -hmm. Sly's brother, we had the group. and uh, but, but Sly, I mean, everyone knew Sly because he had a great, he was a radio disc jockey back then. Yeah. Uh, I talked to David Clayton Thomas uh, recently. He got his break from uh, uh, just being on a show with a friend of his on, uh, I think it was in, uh, a show in Boston, a radio station, and he didn't realize it was 50,000 watts. He just thought he yeah. was just going on there as, a, you know, just talking and doing a show and whatever. And yeah. that's how he got his break, too. From 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the big stations were were powerful back then. Yeah. And it, you know, again, there was no internet and no cable TV mm -hmm. and all this different, you know, hundreds and hundreds of choices. Um, so when you were on a big station, it's just like it, television was the same thing. I yep. remember doing a television show the next day, our lives changed. Oh, yeah. I mean, literally. And, you know, I, 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 I did it with in, intense basic because it was the same place that, you know, I had uh, seen the Beatles for the first time. And I knew yeah. Elvis Presley for the first time. And, yeah. And I, I knew it was powerful, and um, but it, having the experience was <laughs> quite something, you know. It, it's like you're walking through the airport, and the, you know, the day before, and then no one's noticing you. The next day, everyone's noticing you. It's like, hey, we were doing the same thing yesterday. <laughs> so, but uh, it's, it's a powerful thing, you know. I'm, I'm making fun of it, but it's a powerful thing. Did, did you guys uh, lip sync during that show, or did you just play? Uh, we we played live. You, you played live. Good. Awesome. A couple times where the union thing, you know, right. it was you had to. They went, you know, it was this thing with the engineers, and mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it was different back then, you know. And a lot of people did what you call lip sync, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, so sometimes we would just play live straight. You know, I mean, it was you know in the moment. And then sometimes we go in the day before and we go to the studio, we record like a medley of whatever, you know, what we wanted to do. So right. we had a live track and then they play that live track and we play with it and sing live to it. Exactly. So those were the two ways that, uh, yeah, that we approached it back then. Yeah. What, what was, did you, I guess you got, you met Ed, of course. I, I had, uh, I, I talked to a lot of people that were on the show. And I get, get kind of mixed reactions. What would you think about Ed? Oh, he was a funny guy. I mean, yeah. he introduced us once. We did the, it with Ed Sullivan show three times. Okay. One of the times he introduced us as a comedy act. <laughs> Ed, he had introduced us as, you know, it was just like, <laughs> I, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I, I don't even know what to say about it. <laughs> he did it with a straight face. I mean, no one noticed it. I mean, everything worked out as, as, as it was, but he introduced Ben as a comedy act. <laughs> like the hardest new comedy act, cause it's just flying up every stone. <laughs> Who knows, you know? Yeah, he got it wrong a few times. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, he was, uh, he was an iconic figure. He didn't interplay much really with anybody. He just kept, you know, he did his, he got his script and, you know, and introduced people and a, a, a cordial hello after sometimes maybe a couple of words. Yeah. Every once in a while he'd uh, do a personal few words with people, but uh, that was about it, you know. It was like, like the, uh, the late night shows now where you, you know, you sit down and eye to eye and you, you know, you get involved, get into it, you know, conversation. Yeah, the, the, the writing the, show. But the, right. th the thing that you know, I I give Ed a lot of credit because he brought so many great acts, you know, that oh, yeah. nobody yeah. knew. But it, what makes yeah. me mad is when a lot of these talk show host guys they bring the music acts and they don't do their um, due diligence. You know, they don't do the or history. Do homework. They yeah. don't do any homework. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been the case here when he is <laughs> the conflict or someone wrote, or yeah, it might have been just a mistake on his part. I don't know. Like I said. You know, I noticed that I've, I've, I've never had anybody say to me, actually, did you know that that gentleman introduced you guys as a comedy act? <laughs> so it wasn't like a, a heavy uh, conscious thing. It was just something that, you know, it, it was obviously, it was obvious what was going on. It was a music act we played and that kind of, uh, uh, you know, shined uh, brighter than any mistake that may have happened. Yeah. Fortunately. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He's he he was something. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Yeah. All right, here's how, here's a question, and it go, it's going around the internet. I don't know if you've ever answered this before. Uh, life and death in G and A. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, they said that that was done by another band, but a lot of people think that was Sly and the Family Stone who actually sang it and wrote it. Is that what do you? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, uh, my my. My thoughts are actual facts. That we recorded that. That right. was us doing the track. Okay. We didn't sing it. It was, uh, Sly produced, um, I'm trying to remember the fellow's name. He produced the, the singer, it was Sly wrote the song. Mm -hmm. We recorded the track. 
back and he sang and I went, I just, she's, I'm sorry, yeah, forgive me for that. That's okay. I named it. It was a long time ago. They are talking over 50 years ago. And um, he since passed. Actually, a long time ago he passed away. Um, and uh, he was a great singer and it, it never really made, it, it did too much after that, unfortunately. Because he was good. He was kind of like, a, like an older shredding kind right. of cat. But yeah. Had a big voice, you know. But that was us. That's the track is the band. It is the band. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that answers that question. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, I want to mention to everybody, uh, there's, you know, about Sly and Family Stone. I just, you know, Sly Stone, of course, was the leader. Um, you know, multi-instrumentalist, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. There was Freddie Stone, who was the guitarist. Uh, Freddie's now a pastor, correct? That's correct. Yeah. He's got a church in Vallejo, California. Uh, his sister and singer keyboard is Rose Stone, uh, mm-hmm. who, the, the trumpeter, and, and, and Rose is still out there, right? She still yes. performs. Uh, of course, we just lost uh, Cynthia Robinson. She was an incredible, very incredible yeah. musician. We miss her a lot. Yeah. She was great. She was quite a, a personality and just a bright light on stage. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a lot of the interviews. It was you and Jerry and Cynthia doing a lot of uh-huh. interviews together. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're the drummer. Saxophonist is your, is your cousin, right? Jerry Martini? Yeah. Uh, we were, you know, I, I, we weren't real... Okay. I mean, we were cousins, friends for over 50 years and all that, but right. we weren't really cousins. I don't know how that uh, came about, um, but if you, you know, was actually to look under the, in between the pages, we're not real cousins. Okay. Like by family, but um, the virtual family, musical family. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, of course, Larry Graham on bass. That was the, uh, you know, the uh, the classic lineup, I guess. Yeah. And you guys were incredible. You guys were incredible, man. And, you know, you were so so ahead of your time, and, you know, because you, when, when you started all this, this was in the 60s, you know. I, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a, a wonderful experiment that Boston but it really turned into be a moving force in music. Um, and... Uh, you know, I wish it uh, it could have continued on. It could have. The music does. The songs yeah. do. Yep. Songs are as relevant today as, as when they were written. They are. Uh, and which is a testament to a, a good song. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, it wasn't to be as far as the, the original band mm-hmm. uh, staying into the future. It's just a, a small, very small hand piece of few handful of bands that were able to do that and um, even, even though you know along the way uh, the original members passed and such a, but there are still band, bands out there that are still uh, you know like Carlos he represents what he did mm-hmm. and what he's doing now and all right. in between uh, Santana you know he's out there doing it at Grateful Dead or you know they lost Jerry of course but uh I was in the Jerry Garcia band for about 10 years. I saw that. Before, yeah. Before, yeah. That's cool. Uh, and he was a, a wonderful person. Mm-hmm. That was really fun to perform with and and to be around. So it's, um, I mean, it's who else? The Who's out there, you know, two of the guys uh, did, you know, still perform and represent the, the, the spirit, the, the music of which they, they created. Right. Um, but it's far and few between, you know. There is. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of them are retiring, too. Mm-hmm. Well, like I said, time yeah. to wait for anybody, you know. <laughs> as, as years pass by. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even today, you know, the younger generations, although, you know, the songs I, I know, like, a few years ago, I was working with the Family Stone, we went down to Australia, and we had never been there back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, originally, and we were playing these outdoor festivals. A lot of people, all age groups were there. You know, like over 100,000 
young people, wow. young, middle-aged, yep. and they all knew the songs like like we like as if we were had been toured there back then. So uh, again, it's just a testament to good songs, and you know the young people today they don't they may not they know the songs they may not recognize like exactly. the song. Yep. Oh, I'm not sure. And then if you say the title of the song, oh, that's that group. Yeah, I know the song. Yep. You know. Yeah. And uh, I guess that just goes with, you know, not being present still mm-hmm. and performing. Uh, you lose that that identity, the namesake identity, but the songs still get played on the radio, they're in movies, mm-hmm. commercials, what have you, you know, so that they live on exactly. and yep. represent you, you know, represent what you did. Yeah. I've uh, I, re- I wrote a book. It's called The Rockstar Chronicles. It's going to go into four series. That number one came out. It's uh, over fifty interviews, you know, with the legends of rock. And I- I'm doing this so you guys can still be out there, you know, and-, and kids can pick it up and read all about the the greats, you know, that kind of thing. Well, that's fantastic. You know, that period of time, yeah, uh, Ray is was really special time. Yes, I mean, all the, the songs that were created and carved back then of course uh, still live into the future and yep. uh, so again it's a, a testament to <clears throat> great song you know uh, it was just a time a period in time where where there was that intense creativity and there was a lot of things changing and being yep. said and, you know we're still fortunate to be part of it to be uh, during that time you know come from that time mm-hmm. today. Well, I'm a baby boomer, and I'm very proud of that time. I, I was a DJ back in the late 70s. Uh, I did top mm-hmm. top 40 radio, but I grew up in the 60s with all the best DJs in the world, and that's how I that's why I went, got into radios because of those guys, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, being again from San Francisco, late 60s right. with Tom Donahue, mm-hmm. who was the godfather of FM radio format AOR. Right. You know, Al Memorial, he's the, he's the guy that started it. Uh, it him and Bobby Mitchell was, uh, they were program director for a station called KYA. It was a big pop station back mm-hmm. then. Right. And again, it was at that time period where there was like, there was only a couple of stations. And that was one of those stations where you get your record on, you broke nationwide. Right. Because right. It was, they had affiliates in all the big markets across the country. Right. So it was powerful entities. And yeah, I don't know. Do you know who Tom W? you? Oh, yeah. You, sure. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure you yeah. get in the business. Yeah. Those are, yeah. yeah. I, I talked uh-huh. to, I talked to Tommy James and of course the, the, that other side of the record industry, you know, uh, uh-huh. with the mafia and all that too. Um, uh-huh. you know, but that, that was another interest, interesting part. But, you know, he says, you know, like uh, Morris Levy, you know, from uh, yeah. from his record, like Roulette, Roulette Records. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if it wasn't for him, nobody would have known who Tommy James was, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah it was a different world, like I said. A different, <laughs> different world altogether, yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a, was it true that the Black Panther Party uh, demanded that you and Jerry and, and your uh, your manager got fired? Well, I remember that the issue was brought up um, that they had asked Sly to get, you know, yeah, to had to remove us from the band, mm-hmm. have an all-black band or whatever, and he just says, no way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he just, uh, and it was never, it was not a big deal back then, but it just, that subject has come up many times, I've been, I've been asked many times, so mm-hmm. I guess it's been written about or whatever, and but um, it, it it was just kind of like a non-issue at the time. Right, right. I mean, slight slight handle it, and that was the end of that. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing that comes about is <clears throat> uh, Larry Graham uh, had a an argument or a fight with Bubba Banks and uh, Eddie Chin, and uh, there, there, he's something about hiring a hitman to kill Sly. Was that true? <laughs> no, those are those are probably drug induced rumors, you know. <laughs> it, 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 it was crazy then, you know, things got kind of chaotic, but um, I, I don't, um, I, I remember that rumor, but, you know, again. 
Who knows? There's rumors <laughs> and then there's the reality, you know? Yeah. The reality is what you say. You yeah. Know? Well, you know, the internet, you get all kinds of, you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it goes with the territory. Right. I, I see that, uh, I, di- I didn't realize this at the time. Bobby Walmack actually replaced Graham at that time. Was that? No. No, that's, true. that's, that's not true. Bobby Walmack collaborated with Sly, okay. but not as or in Sly and the Family Stone. Right. Uh, and the fellow that replaced Larry Graham was uh, Rusty Allen. Rusty Allen, yeah, he was young at yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. Young bass player, and uh, mm-hmm. I was already, I had left the move by that period, by that time, I left in 71. 71, yeah. Well, now why did, why did you, why did you leave? I know there was, uh, turmoil going on after you left. And so that's why Graham left as well. So you probably yeah, saw the writing on the wall, huh? He left a year later. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah, well, you know, things have changed, and again, you know, I, I guess, in the beginning, uh, the music was the most important thing, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, you know, that probably changed to be where other things were more important, like right? Drugs and stuff like that. And yeah, <clears throat> I think um, had that been the case in the beginning, we would have never uh, created the wonderful path that we carved. And um, so, you know, there's a place for everything, mm-hmm. I guess, but. Uh, I think they got in the way, you know. Right, right. It was just yeah. the timing was right, I guess. It's time yeah. to move on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, in my opinion, I think Sly Swan song was "If You Want Me to Stay," because that that was probably one of his last big hits. I think, right back in '73. Just about, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was a good song. Great song. Yeah, great song. Uh, I, I like playing that uh, today mm-hmm. still. You know. Yeah. What what was the last time you saw a Sly? Um, let's see. A couple of years ago now, I think it, it's been. There was this convention that we did in Oakland a few years back. That was probably the last time that, uh, I seen him. How's he How's he doing? He's still all right. You know, he's kind of just grooving. His health is is what I understand is not tip top. Yeah. Right now, you know, and the age is starting to get him, and, you know, uh, but I think he's been, uh, from what I hear, you know, he's just been coasting and doing his thing, you know. Uh, unfortunately, you know, he's not even getting to perform it or anything for quite a while. Yeah. His, his voice has kind of failed, you know. And, um, so, again, the songs uh, live on, <laughs> and, and the memories. Uh, everyone gets to that point at some at some point in time. You know, it, it's it's amazing though how many hits you know he wrote in that short yeah. period of time. You know, I mean that's yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a uh, quantum. How, do you, how would you say it? The, the quantum time period, uh-huh. you know, I mean, all that, uh, that song book was mostly created in, uh, between, we started the group in December of 66. Wow. I left in 71, Larry right. left in 72. Yep. And then Sly did, you know, like you said, if you, if you want me to stay, mm-hmm. one of the last ones, it wasn't the last one, but by 75, he, he stopped touring. Right. That was it. And he did some collaborations with, you know, different people, Bobby Womack or right. the Fire, I think. And my brother Johnson. You know. <clears throat> I'm I'm it's friends good. with uh Bobby Womack's nephew, Binky. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> he's yeah. A, yeah, he's a good guy. He's he's got music out there, but he's having a hard time getting discovered, you know, and he plays rock yeah. he plays rock. Rock and funk, you know, he's he's, yeah. he's great. Yeah. yeah. I I haven't heard him. I've heard the name, but I, I haven't heard the band. Yeah, group, you know, Binky B- Womack. <laughs> yeah, 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 really good guy. You guys had uh, let's see, some of the albums. The um, there's a riot going on. It wasn't that released on red vinyl not not that long ago, right? Uh, it could have been. I don't know. I mean, original release, of course, was back 
you know, in 71. Right. Uh, and I even had, that came out after I left, but there was a, a few tracks that I had played on. Uh-huh. That, that, we, that we hadn't finished, and then, you know, the slide took them and finished them, and did a couple new tunes, and, and that was Riot. Uh, if it's been re-released, yeah. actually, you know, a lot of those records have been released right. many times in different formats, CDs, you know, gold pressings, you know, you name it. And so I'm not surprised the uh, red vinyl or what have you. It's, it's, it's great because vinyl is a, is a wonderful, warm, mm-hmm. big sounding format for, that's how, you know, that's what we, that, that, that was the default when we were doing it. Right. <clears throat> and then later on, it's good to see the young people rediscovering vinyl. And wow, they, they listen to it for the first time. They said, oh, is that what it's supposed to sound like? You know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, not that digital is bad, it's just, it's just a different thing. It's, it's not the really, same. You know, it's not the same. Yeah, vinyl, yeah. can't say nothing bad about it. Yeah, even CDs were not the same. And they, they, lied, about C- right. they lied about CDs. They said they would never scratch. Bologna. Yeah. <laughs> they, they do. They scratch. They, they scratch. break. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's crazy. I mean, now, you know, it went vinyl to set to CDs, and just now it's just, yeah. it's, all, it's all celestial, you know? Yeah. Streaming. Yeah. It, I just heard a thing. Mm-hmm. Now, they just seen a news thing. Some of this the other day, CD Baby. Yeah. 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 My, my, my book is on, um, book, uh, book baby. (laughs) Published by book baby. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Book, book, uh, publishing. uh, Yeah. Internet publishing. Yeah. 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 They do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Well, you were inducted in 1993 by, uh, one of the kings of funk, of course, George Clinton. Yeah, I just spoke to him the other day. Okay. How's he doing? Is he, cause he, he, he's doing good. He's doing really good. It was great. I, I was supposed to, you know, I was, I had heard he was coming to town here. Uh-huh. And I had planned, I was going to go see him. And then something came up, I had to go to LA. Right. And, uh, and so I actually made my, arranged my flight so I could be late, uh, that night. And I, I figured I'd go and at least I'd, I know I'd catch him at sound check and we could sit down and talk for a minute, which we did. Mm-hmm. I wasn't able to see the show, but he, you know, he showed up. He was cool, doing good. He laid down a couple of uh, uh, poems that he had in his head. <laughs> and it was just, he was sharp, mm-hmm. it was witty, it was very cool. I enjoyed talking to him. Uh, I'll probably get, get with him again. Yeah, there was a rumor that he was retiring too. Is that is he's uh, he's actually on his uh, you know retirement tour. His, uh, his first <laughs> his first one. <laughs> yeah, first, number one, right? Yeah, uh, he, he seems to be enjoying himself, and so it's all good. Yeah, I saw the Funkadelic back in seventy uh, three. Uh, it was Rare Earth, the Funkadelic, and the Ohio Players back in seven. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, what a show! <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. yeah, you know how music oh. bring, brings us together. You know, I was it was only maybe three white guys in the whole audience out of uh, like fourteen thousand in Baltimore, and oh. no problems. We, you know, I, I was on this uh, uh, up on a seat with uh, uh, a black chick. We were dancing away, and mm-hmm. music brings us together, man. You know, and it, it's, it's Absolutely true. Yeah. It's funny you say that because that night that George was here, I had to go to L.A. Because right. Because the next day I had an interview with uh, Amir Questlove, who is the director of a movie that will be called The Blackwood Stock. Oh, wow. And it was based, it's based on a show that we had did uh-huh. in uh, August or the end of July of 69. It was uh, the Harlem Cultural Festival, it was called. Mm -hmm. And it was in Mount Morris Park. It was outdoors in New York City, up in Harlem. Right. And it was tens of thousands of people all from Harlem. Mm -hmm. So here here again, you know, like you said, you can just put us together. There is no no color. I mean, Jerry and I were probably the only two white people there, other than maybe the crew from ABC who filmed it. Right.
69, the summer of 69, mm -hmm. in Harlem. And there were many acts on it. Stevie Wonder, Last Night, I mean, a lot of acts. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know. I thought it was just this one day, this this day we, you know, we performed. Um, actually, <clears throat> Sly and I both had the flu. We had fevers. We were oh, looking for one. <laughs> but we went on and we did the band delivered big time. We had to. <laughs> yeah. They, they came to uh, <clears throat> they came to check it out, and we delivered. It was a great show. And so anyway, I guess that they're doing a movie on it. Just to, 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 you know, very cool. And I'm not sure what all the discussion mm -hmm. will be, but just, I get the impression something will be the fact that it was just overlooked, mm -hmm. maybe overshadowed by Woodstock when it went on that within weeks of the, this event. Yeah. And the media overlooked it. It just never. You know, people didn't even know about it, so they're they're bringing it to light, and I, I, I assume that there's some fantastic uh, footage on there, of, you know, like of performances, and uh, there's interviews with some of the people that you know performed, uh, like myself, mm -hmm. that were, were around still to interview, and um, so it sounds like it's interesting. One, and anyway, that's why I went that night. That's why I went down to oh, LA cool. to shoot that next day. Yeah, we'll be looking out for that, you know. I'll do the research and, and look and see when uh, that's coming out. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's been a press release on the fact that the press love is the director. Mm -hmm. It shows that this is his first uh, wearing a director's hat. And uh, so he's doing a good job. I mean, they filmed the interview and they had a crew there and uh, great questions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm uh, in anticipation of seeing how this all comes out. You know, you know the '60s. You know, a lot of people have a uh, misconception about that. I, I grew up in D.C., and my dad had stores on F Street for years and since the early '60s. We went through the riots in '68. We saw what uh -huh. happened, you know, and everything. But yeah. you know, it wasn't a black and white thing. I mean, if you were hip, you were cool. You know, we got along yeah. fine. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If you, as long as you weren't an idiot, you know, white guys weren't idiots. You know, you were, you know, and, and like you said, the music bonded everybody together. You know, it really. That's did. right. Well, music is, is powerful. You know, beyond it, it, there's no borders. I mean, beyond right. just racial considerations, as you know, different ethnic groups, all yep. different countries. I mean, it. Uh, I think music was one of the things that, uh, you know, when. Uh, when the West went to the East, mm -hmm. like as far as, you know, uh, China, Russia, right. it was music that exactly. broke, the, you know, it wasn't politics or politicians that said, okay, let's get a bunch of people together. And yep. It was music that did it, and it did it. You're right. absolutely right. You know? Yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. And you guys, you guys were the uh, the front runners in that. You know, it was bands like you. It was uh, Rare Earth. You know, white guys on a Motown label. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric Burden. You know, with War. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This was in that, that was a time where there was there was a challenge a challenge to do that because the just you know there, there were big there were great challenges that existed at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, uh, you know, ethnicity, uh, I hope I said that right. <laughs> you did? And, um, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of problems in the country. Yeah. Much for that. And yeah. So, <clears throat> music's a powerful thing. Music is it, a powerful thing. It is single-handedly what uh, yeah. broke those barriers down and said that, you know, you could do this. Exactly. You know? It's cool. Exactly. All right, I got to talk about Woodstock a little bit. What, what, what was yeah. your impression of Woodstock? What was my impression of Woodstock? Uh-huh. Uh, surrealistic. It was just amazing one time, you know, one of a one of a kind event that was not uh wasn't planned. I mean it it was a happening. It happened. It happened um regardless of the uh, people's planning or lack of planning. <clears throat> and it was a very cool thing. And I, I think the, the attempts to do, you know, Woodstock 2 and Woodstock 3 were kind of silly things. And, yeah, I, uh, I agree. Uh, they ended up failing, yeah. uh, from what I understand. I didn't go to them. But um, that's what I understand. And it was just a really unique, special event. 
shit. Powerful. Yeah, you so. and you guys were incredible. I mean, you were voted like you know the best, uh, you know, energetic. Yeah, well, act. yeah. Again, again, uh, we you know did our thing. We yeah. On the way in the wee hours of the morning, uh, we're supposed to go on at eight p.m. on Saturday evening. Uh huh. Ended up going on three a.m. Sunday morning, and uh, which was quite the challenge. Uh, just you know. Uh, just trying to be prepared and getting your adrenal up for the show and then having to wait another hour and another hour and, and, and then the fact that the, you know this, this crowd that was there were, it was springing uh, at that time and they had been there already a few days rain, sun, you know dust, heat, you name it and they're done you know mm -hmm. and so I Here is I want to take you high and, and the crowd yelling and screaming. It was great. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, they, they meant it. They, they meant. <laughs> oh yeah, they did. Yeah. You know, you know. I talked to a lot of guys that were at Woodstock, and uh, they, a lot of them, some left right away, but some hung around, like Paul Katner. You know, he, mm -hmm. he. I talked to him. You know, he passed away, but he was he's great. He was a great guy, but he stayed. Yeah. For the whole thing, and he want, he said I wanted to see Sly the Family Stone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I hope he got there. Uh, yeah, a lot of the you know legal the, the choice of staying was sometimes the, your transportation might have been out in, or sometimes you put other commitments, so they had to leave. So I had, I guess he had the luxury of not having anything to do right. after, so he decided to hang out at this event and just. Soak it all up. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I would have. Uh, I think we left. Jeez. Uh, Early that morning. I remember the who went on after us. The sun was coming up. Mm -hmm. Um. I think we left. Yeah, yeah, it was early Sunday morning. So I didn't get to see Hendrix even because he, he came out in the afternoon. Yeah. <clears throat> but we had to take off. You know, we yeah. came in on the helicopters. You couldn't drive in. Yep. And then because of the just cars parked on the highway and mud and what have you. Did, did, did you know Jimmy? Uh, we, we we did some touring together. We toured after that in Europe. Uh -huh. And he actually asked me uh, to do a band with him because he was, said he was changing. He was going to do something new right. and different. And uh, at the time he asked me, uh, it was like at the peak of our career, and I so I couldn't leave the band. Right. I mean, I I fondly accepted his, you know, mm -hmm. his, his, you know. I mean, I I was thrilled by his offer, and I would have loved to do it, but I did. But again, I couldn't leave the band at that time, and uh, so shortly after that, uh, the band of Gypsies with Buddy. Right, buddy right. All right, let me get this, let me get this on record. You turned down Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> well, you know, uh, unbelievably, but uh, yeah, I, th I thought it was what I should do at the time. You know, right, right, yeah. Well, you you yeah, did. So we did. We were doing we were doing some touring in Europe, like yep. Permanent Island, Germany. We did uh, Isle of Wight, Pop mm -hmm. Festival. Yeah, there was some. Some shows back there, and then you know, fortunately, not too not too long after that, um, then he passed. You you were on the uh, Carlos Santana Buddy Miles live album, which is another yeah. one that sticks out in your mind. You know, especially the album cover. That mm -hmm. that, that was a great album, and you got to you got to do them changes. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. We had the uh, I got some actually I got some Super Eight home. A super eight millimeter home movie of us like going up to the, the crater. Uh, someone had 
uh, we're in the station wagon. I remember there was this one scene where uh, we're in a station wagon. This is me and Greg Rowley and Carlos. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, I think it was Coco Escobedo. Uh, and someone threw, you know, like a, a package of firecrackers? Right. You know, like the, the string of them? Yeah. Someone threw a string in the in the window of the station wagon. Was crashed. Oh so, man! Never <laughs> <laughs> see a car empty so fast. No one got hurt, fortunately. I mean, someone could have got hurt, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was just crazy times. We had fun. We had a lot of fun. That this was great. The crowds, everybody was mm-hmm. just good, good spirit then, you know. Yeah, I I love Buddy Miles, and he's been coming up a lot on my show lately. I had Bobby Berge. Uh, mm-hmm. You grew up with him in Iowa, and uh, mm-hmm. and you know, of course, we talk about Tommy Bolin and and all kinds of stuff. But uh, so many guys, you know, play. You know, they they knew Buddy. You know, yeah. Billy Just Cobham. Yeah, Billy Cobham. Yeah. Talked about Buddy and good friends, and and he and played some too. Great vocalist. He played some guitar. Buddy played some guitar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah, good guy. Yeah, and I saw on your um, on your website you had. Uh, um, God, Cindy, Cindy Blackman, Santana. Mm-hmm. Uh, she she was on the show. She's cool. I, I like. Oh her. yeah, yeah. Great drummer, and mm-hmm. uh, she's phenomenal. I mean, you know, Carlos will work. Uh, he'll do a couple hours set, and then at the end of the set, the last thing that happens is she does a drum solo, right? And she'll play for twenty minutes after a two hour set. You uh-huh. know, and you know this. Little gal, you know, must weigh 110 pounds. <laughs> and, I mean, she, she, you close your eyes and, you know, it's a big person playing, you know. She's fantastic. She's a great drummer. Yeah. And, yeah. She was great with uh, Lenny Kravitz. Yeah. Yeah, that band. A lot of passion. So, she plays with a lot of passion. Yep. And knowledge. Mm-hmm. Some other things you've done. You did uh, Cracked Actor, Live Los Angeles 74. You, you work with Bowie? Yeah. David Bowie wow. was the uh, Diamond Dog Store. Yeah. Dougie Rouch was on bass. Uh huh. And fantastic band. Michael Garson, keyboard, Joe Flick, guitar. Wow. Um, the, the Luther Vandross singing background. Man. Vocals. David Sanborn on tenor sax. Mm. They was a cra- crazy good band. Yeah. Wow. And David Bowie was a <clears throat> unique individual. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Man, your resume is incredible. You, you you were on Betty Davis's first album too, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Miles' ex-wife. Yeah. Yeah. That, that uh, it's, she's got quite a cult following, you know, uh, for never having like quote unquote hit records. Right. Uh, the the consciousness of of her music and the fan base worldwide just just amazes me because it just continues and she disappeared way back in the yeah. late 70s yeah and um uh, there's been a couple documentaries and films done on her one that just came actually no and then w- 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 how about uh the pitbull song timber how come there were so mm-hmm. many writing credits on that song <laughs> How come there were so many writing credits? Yeah, there was a lot of writing credits on that song, including well, yourself. Because uh, that song originally comes from a song called San Francisco Bay that I wrote and uh, co-wrote with the Oscar and I produced right. record back in the, geez, the early 70s, I think 74. And then um, later on, move forward into the future, Keisha, you know, did a collaboration, and and they they, they took that song, mm-hmm. and then they added, you know, their thing to it, and it ends up being eleven writers, yeah. and Lee and I, on it. And uh, I mean, I, I gotta say, whatever it worked. I mean, <laughs> that song um, did like over ten million units worldwide. Wow, including streaming and everything. That's pretty significant. Yeah. And, uh, you, you need to be songwriting, uh, you know. That you, there's so much more that you can do nowadays. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, we, we need you, man. That, uh, <laughs> that we did a long time ago, and it, it came back in a wonderful way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. 
Uh, uh-huh. Something I don't understand. Something about a scientific paper. Uh, with you got the highest degree at page rank centralities or something like that. And what is that all? Well, about? you know, that's the internet thing, and I'm, I, I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see it myself. I, I forgot how it was sent to me or how I became uh, aware of it. Right. But uh, I guess you. I, and I'm not even. I, I don't remember. I, I remember addressing it for a minute when it came, and I might have put it up on my page or something like that. There's a link maybe, and that's probably how you found it. Otherwise, I'm not even sure. I don't remember what it even addressed. <laughs> what it said. Well, you're you're in there. Is it the highest degree and page rank centralities, and the second highest. I ain't, I don't even know how to pronounce that. I, oh, so it's the internet thing. It's, it's like internet, internet thing? traffic, I guess. For right? musicians of all time. Yeah, well, it's, huh. it's been, uh, I'm turning red. <laughs> you know, it's wonderful. I mean, who would, you know, it's like, it's kind of like in the mid 80s, uh, you know, I had stopped touring for a while, I wasn't touring that much, and, uh-huh. and this guy, um, who was a big fan of the groups, uh, Develop a web page representing Sly and the Family Stone. I didn't even know what a computer was yet at that time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he actually befriended us and uh, came out, visited, got me into computer and doing emails and all that stuff. Right, and it was, it was I, I, I got to say, it was a powerful thing because it kind of reconnected me with with my past even in the way that I, I was getting emails and people were reflecting, you know, which I would have never known this stuff. I mean, these people would have never been able to get a hold of me right. and express themselves and uh, in the way that, you know, w- what the music meant to them, what it did, or my plane got him playing, changed his life, and that's and all these different reflections, personal things that were inspiring to me to get back into it and get busy again. Mm-hmm. And it, it really did, you know. And so there is, uh, the, you know, the wonderful the technology of the Internet it brings us and connects us and makes it a smaller world and yeah. puts us all together again. Uh, so it's uh, kind of a cool thing, you know. Does this mean you're going to be the next Bill Gates or something? Or <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> He's doing a good job. I don't know, musicians end up being pretty smart besides being musicians, like uh, Jeff Skunk Baxter, you know, he works uh-huh. with the military. <laughs> yeah. The defense yeah, system. I, yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you I've know? heard that, yeah, I, I, I know about that. I find it very interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you could bring uh, something to the table. Exactly. That, um, that works uh, for a good purpose. Why not, you know? Well, music is kind of like mathematics in a way, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Greg, here's a here's your final question, and I ask a lot of artists this question. I get some interesting answers. Uh, if you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, uh, to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who, who would that be? Oh, gee. Uh, maybe I'd go back and take that gig with Hendrix. Replacing like, Ringo and the Beatles? Any. <laughs> yeah. Replacing uh, Ringo and the Beatles? No? He's too slow for you. Not enough. No. No. <laughs> no, that would be quite the experience. I love like, so much. I listen to their Beatles channel on uh, Sirius XM uh-huh. uh, often. Yeah. You know, I grew up with the music, right? Sure. Great songs, again. Great songs. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I would have liked to see seen you in that... Uh, Hendrix Power Trio. That would have been cool. Yeah. 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 No, we'll, we'll leave it at that, right? Okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yeah. All Greg, right. Greg, anything else you need to promote or uh, chat about? Do we cover just about everything? Or? Oh, I'm, I'm good right now. I think, uh, I don't, you know, I don't have anything necessarily on the top of my mind right now. Okay. Um, it just, um, like I said, feel fortunate to be able to still go out and do it yeah. and uh, it, it, it feels as good as it did the day I started you know well we 
we want to see an album with you collaborating with a bunch of guys, all your friends. How's that? That's highly possible. Yeah. You got highly so many, possible. you got, you know, so many people. It'd be, you know, be a great album. <laughs> highly possible. Yeah. Let's keep it on the short list. Okay. We'll follow up with you yeah. in the future. All right. <laughs> Greg, thank you for being on the show, man, for all your time. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, good luck. And, uh, you know, anytime you want to be on the show to promote anything, let me know. I will do. And uh, thanks for having me, Ray. Enjoy it. All right, Greg. Thanks again, man. All right. All right. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more information about Greg Arico, visit www.facebook.com backslash Greg Arico. Also, www.allmusic.com uh, backslash artist backslash Greg Arico. To find out all of Greg Rico's credits, he has a tremendous, tremendous resume. And www.slystonemusic.com. Very special thanks to the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of Interviewing the Legends. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho, for the very latest interviews. It's real news, people. And, of course, my new book, finally out, entitled The Rockstar Chronicles, Truths, Confessions, and Wisdom from the Music Legends That Set Us Free. Order yours today on hardcover or ebook, or at bookbaby.com and or in at amazon.com. Featuring over 45 intimate conversations with some of the greatest rock legends on the planet. Get your copy now. And have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941 877 one five five two, or visit us at publicityworksagency.com, specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio Station One.